Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's discussion, A Climate for Business, Investing in U.S. Competitiveness. I'm Nat Cohan, and I'm the president here at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, or C2ES. First, a couple of housekeeping items. The format of today's event will be a fireside chat followed by audience Q&A. We'll have limited time for that Q&A, but we will try to get to as many questions as possible. So please submit your questions into the Q&A portion of Zoom and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We will be recording today's conversation and a recording will be made available on the C2ES YouTube page within 24 hours. Uh, now in a few minutes, I'll turn to hear from our guest, Tom Leinberger, the chairman and CEO of Cummins, He's a widely respected and uh, recognized business voice on climate and a leader at a company that's rising to meet the climate challenge. Before that, I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction, including saying a few words about C2ES. Our mission is to accelerate the transition to a just, resilient, and thriving net zero economy. Since our founding over 20 years ago, we've worked with policymakers, businesses, and other stakeholders to build support for effective and ambitious climate policies. And core to our work is the conviction that smart, well-designed policy can accelerate the low carbon transition while also growing the economy, sustaining good jobs and improving people's everyday lives. The United States at this moment needs a huge range of policies and investments, including comprehensive tax incentives for clean energy, support for electric vehicles, investment in clean energy, uh, supply chains, and more to meet our Paris Agreement target of cutting emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030, and to put us on track to meeting our long-run goal of net zero emissions by 2050. We also need to invest in communities, especially marginalized communities that have been, uh, that have borne the brunt of past pollution, uh, to build resilience to a climate that is already changing. Many of those provisions were included in last year's Build Back Better Act. But as I think all of us know, that particular bill is not moving forward in this Congress. But we, at the same time, we know we can't afford not to enact strong policies that spur private investment, drive down emissions and create jobs. And the good news is that the climate and energy provisions in that Build Back Better framework did have and do continue to have strong support in Congress. If enacted, they would represent the single largest investment in our nation's low carbon future and establish a foundation for a modern and globally competitive clean energy economy. Now, as leading companies would attest, the business case for climate action has never been stronger. That's why 27 companies, including Cummins, signed a letter last month urging congressional leadership to overcome the present impasse and see that those historic climate investments are made. Now, we're particularly pleased today to have with us Tom Leinbarger to share his perspective on how low carbon investments can help the United States lead the transition to a net zero economy. Cummins is the largest independent maker of diesel engines and related products in the world. Tom joined Cummins in 1993 and worked his way up to become chairman and CEO in 2012. With a, with, with a hundred year record of innovations, Cummins is committed to doing what it can to address the world's climate challenge. Tom, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. Nat, it's great to be with you, thank you. Maybe we can start, Tom, just by telling us uh, a little about Cummins and why you all support climate policy um, and, and so, it, you know, climate policy broadly, but also the provisions in the, in the Build Back Better Act. Well, that may, it may surprise uh, some of your listeners to see the, the diesel engine CEO here pushing for climate change provisions. Um, I hope it doesn't, but it, it might. Um, look, look, as you said, Cummins is a hundred year old company. We got into the diesel business because diesel at the time was the most innovative technology for commercial vehicles and industrial solutions. It was the one that offered better fuel economy, more range, more power uh, relative to its predecessor technologies, which were gasoline driven engines for those large applications. And, and, and that history of innovation means we're always looking for new solutions. The, the most recent was, of course, with the Clean Air Act, we had to introduce 
you know, billions of dollars of R and D we, we we did to introduce new technologies to to clean up diesel engines and make them more uh, more applicable for a modern world where we weren't going to tolerate that level of criteria pollutants. And and our people thought that task was worthy of of dedicating their careers and lives to. And so and our mission statement is to make make the world more prosperous. And in that definition for us is sustainable not you know it's not more prosperous if you're rich and and choking on the air or can't drink the water so we have a we have a mission statement commitment and we also believe that it's more profitable for Cummins to find solutions to these new challenges not just keep offering older technology so we've turned the company forward to say yes of course we're going to continue to provide internal combustion engines we think they're still uh, a good solution in a lot of places but everything we do every new engine we launch every new battery electric powertrain, every new fuel cell electric powertrain that we offer is gonna reduce its carbon footprint and it's gonna to continue to drive technology forward so that we can reach our goal of 2050 net zero. And, and of course we have a big part to play. Commercial industrial applications generate a lot of carbon. And so Cummins can make a big difference here. And, and I think just for myself, speaking for myself, I see it both as a a mission and profitability opportunity for Cummins and also as a duty uh, as a leader to say, I know what the science says, I'm clear on it. Uh, there's no question that if we don't act and act now, we will regret that. Well, thanks, thanks for that. That's a that's a great answer and, a, and, and sets the table, I think, for our conversation. Um, so I, I want to go to some of those policy provisions that we need. I mentioned the letter that you all signed uh, uh, that you along with 26 other companies and we've dropped that into the chat for the audience to see. Um, obviously there was a lot in the Build Back Better Act, a lot of climate as well, but from your perspective, what provisions do you see in that, it, it, that, that were in that bill that, that could move forward in this year, maybe in another vehicle that are particularly important here for, for climate and energy? Yeah, the, you know, there, it's a big bill. There was a lot in it, as you guessed. So, so uh, n needless to say, I could find fault with parts of it. But again, it may it may just be my age, or it may be that that I, I view this climate change issue as sort of the existential crisis of our time. I I felt like a business to be responsible had to just put all those other things aside for the moment and say, yeah, but this is the most important thing. So we, we came out in support of the Build Back Better Act, despite the fact that we didn't love all the tax provisions and I'd say further, did more, even more than didn't love them. Um, but, but, you know, the energy part of the bill, the, the tax provisions that supported uh, tax credits for low carbon fuel production, 30% uh, investment tax credits are for, for trucks that would adopt some of these new technologies and then a clean hydrogen production uh, credit. Th those are all things which I think go at least some of the way towards helping in the, the development of infrastructure, because now you know there's going to be business there. It helps with the deployment of the technology. So we've got technologies today, but the question is, how do we deploy them since they're they're not competitive with the, the lowest cost solutions out there today? And then how do we continue to invest in R&D? I think these provisions move that development, deployment, and, and infrastructure efforts up and I do think that all of us have to participate. Every company, every citizen, government, all has to play a role. And I saw this Build Back Better Act as government stepping in, at least in a significant way, to play its role in making change. And and that 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 I thought was important. So I went and uh, I I came out in, f in favor of the bill, and I and I signed this letter. Um, and as you said, what's going to happen next? I'm not sure, but just suffice it to say that I'm going to keep speaking out to say we're out of time we, we need to move and move fast and and even if we don't like every element of it we we need to start start creating infrastructure faster we need to start creating incentives for people to adopt and deploy the technology faster you know thank thanks for that and and uh and again there, lots we'll be getting into um through throughout this conversation i'm sure lots of questions that folks will have as well about some of those policy details but let me take us down a little bit to the community level um what are the in terms of the op the the communities that you operate in and i'm thinking about ones where you you have you know facilities and manufacturing of course cummins products are, are everywhere um but in the communities you operate in what do those policies mean for those for those communities in terms of jobs and and the economy and so on 
Nat, I can't tell you when I go to a plant today, every single person wants to know what about my future? How, how am I going to have a job or a future in this economy? If you know, with all, with all these technology changes going around me, they all see it, they hear it, they see it, they know it's coming and they want to know what their future is. And if I go back to our experience with the Clean Air Act, because the US put the Clean Air Act in in front of other countries adopting clean air standards, we got ahead on developing technologies that went on commercial industrial engines to meet the Clean Air Act regs, then we were able to take those technologies to Europe, China, India, et cetera. In fact, it was the big single biggest market share gain Cummins had in its history, 100 year history was as a result of developing technologies that cost us a lot of money, by the way, and were not easy to do to meet the Clean Air Act. And then when everybody got on that regulatory page, there you're the leader, you're not the follower. And that meant jobs for people in Indiana and other places where we operate. So I think this, there is a, a perfect parallel here. Everybody knows that climate change is coming. Everybody knows it's gonna cause us to adopt our technologies. The question is, do we wanna be at the front edge of that where we're developing the technology here, we're manufacturing here, the jobs are here, or do we wanna be on the tail end, meaning we're buying technologies from Germany or China or India and bringing them here? Doesn't mean there's no jobs here, but way fewer. And, and so I, I think that's a key element on community. The second thing, of course, is there's a major environmental justice issue to be addressed here. Um, and you know, if we, if we talk about things We'll, I'm sure we'll get to things like carbon tax and others, but all these these new technologies come at some cost. You know, we will, of course, get the cost down as volumes ramp up, et cetera, but the costs are there. There is a transition cost, and there's been a lot of studies to say, you know, that, to estimate what they are, and I've, I've read a lot of them, and they're not, they're, they're consequential. They're big, big cost in, impacts. So we have to find ways to make sure that the poorest segments of our society don't pay all of the, or at least or a disproportionate uh, part of those costs. And I think policies are, are available to us to do that. The thing we can't afford to do is not move because we're afraid that it's gonna affect poor communities more. Because who? my question is who's gonna be affected more by climate change than poor communities? Those are the ones where they're gonna be most impacted. So if we don't move faster, it will be the poorest communities that will be impacted most. So we have to move. And yes, we have to find ways to do environmental justice and, and redistribute the costs, but not moving while we debate how to come up with a perfect regulatory framework so that, that, that the poorest communities aren't affected, I think is a mistake. We have to move now and then figure out how we minimize the distributive effects of the policies as we move. Don't don't stand still and debate and wring our hands. That's my strongest view. I, my, in our communities, we need we need to make sure we have jobs and we need to make sure that climate doesn't wipe out the neighborhoods and in the livelihoods of so many of the people in our communities. Well, thank, thanks. And I, I think that depiction of you know the, the importance of American leadership and leadership on policy in the example of the Clean Air Act and the connection that has to the global competitiveness of American manufacturing, I think is a really important connection. I actually, I wanna come back in a minute to pick up on that, uh, on, on another angle of that environmental justice point. But, but first, let me just take a step back and say, in terms of policies, I mean, as we said, there's a lot in Build Back Better, but there's also a lot that's not. It's a reconciliation bill, it's, um, but it's also, you know, it's, it's focused on a particular set of provisions. What are the other things that when you see in terms of policy provisions that, that Congress should be thinking about, the administration should be thinking about that can help both Cummins meet your commitments, uh, but also help the U.S. meet the targets we've laid out. Yeah, I mean, not the biggest one. I mean, because we want to bring everybody in, we need everybody participating. We need market mechanisms to make it more expensive to generate things we don't want and less expensive to generate things we do want. And that means some kind of price on carbon. And, and I'm trying to get really smart about the different um, uh, ways you can do that, and I've been uh, uh, investing a lot of time in that. Um, so, but but I won't I won't pretend like I'm a policy expert in carbon tax. I would just tell you that it, right now carbon is roughly free to produce, and it's and we know how we have huge investments 
in our industries to produce energy and use energy that's carbon intensive. So those, those technologies are the, the lowest cost, the easiest produce, all the capitals in place. So without a market mechanism, the regulatory framework we need to get all the way there is so complex and so long from here that I worry it'll be all too late and we'll be wondering why we didn't do more when we talk to our grandkids. So I think we need a market mechanism and we need it now. Does it do everything? It does not. It will not address every problem. It will not handle the distributive effects. There are areas in the energy sector where, where carbon tax will not be enough um, or, or in, in high carbon things, maybe like um, fertilizer that you know we don't maybe want a carbon tax high enough to do that. So regulatory frameworks will be necessary as well as redistribution policies, but you, we need some bulwark to start internalizing the externality, which is carbon, or else every we're just not going to have enough players on the field to get it done. It's just too much to do. Uh, the second thing that is in, not in there, at least not big enough, is the grid. I, I just think, it, I know everybody knows we need to move the grid, we need to make it bigger for, I mean, we, we are investing a lot in battery electric powertrains for commercial vehicles. But the charging requirements are going to be huge and we need a lot more grid we need a lot more renewable grid or that is all really for naught and and i think the de technologies today are are deployable yes they're a little more expensive but they're deployable but the infrastructure is not available for the vast majority of our customers so we have to get going on grid and grid deployment at a speed that's not even close to the, the speed we're going now. Everyone agrees with that, by the way, if you go to the DOE, you, they say that everyone agrees, but I just watch it, what the rate at which we're spending compared to the rate we need to spend. And I say, it's not close enough. That's really interesting to hear. And of course, you, you know, you, you'll get no arguments from me on either of those, especially on the carbon pricing. C2S yeah. has always stood for market mechanisms and I'm, I once taught economics, so I, I, I agree with everything you said. And, and I often think about the way that a carbon price, and you laid it out beautifully, I think, the argument for it. In addition to that, just thinking about how a carbon price would make everything else work better, right? I mean, as you said, it's not a silver bullet, but it aligns the whole economy in a way that all the other investments that might be made, all the other clean tax credits, all the supply chain investments, all of that is now pushing in the direction of low carbon. And you've got the incentives, the economy aligns, so you're not pushing upstream as it were. And of course, as I think you and I have also talked about on other occasions, there's a connection between the competitiveness and the carbon price too, because right now we're not pricing carbon, we're also not pricing what we import in terms of carbon. And if we had a level playing field, that's where some of the, the, you know, the real, uh, the, the advantage of, of American manufacturing could, could shine through. Um, I wanna encourage folks in the audience to, uh, we're, I, I've just got one or two more questions for Tom and then I'm gonna to turn to the audience Q&A. So, if you've got some questions, please do put them in the Q&A function for Zoom uh, and, uh, and we'll gather those and, and put them to Tom. But let me now come back and, and connect the dots between a couple of the themes here. Um, you mentioned the role of the Clean Air Act. Uh, you mentioned the importance of thinking about environmental justice and, and some of the most vulnerable communities. Um, you know, we've been talking about climate, but of course, another impact obviously of uh, you know, medium and heavy duty trucks is uh, it have a big impact on air pollution. I know you've thought a lot about that at Cummins in terms of how to reduce that impact. And that's something where there's such a clear uh, synergy, I think, in terms of how we think about reducing greenhouse gas emission, but also how we reduce conventional air pollution, soot and, and ozone that really, you know, if you, if you look at truck corridors, that's often a big uh, source of pollution in, in poor communities, uh, low income minority communities. So say a little bit about that and, and how that angle uh, affects your thinking at, at Cummins. It, it really is an important point you, you make now. So we have been continuing to reduce criteria pollutants. I mean, now our engines are 99% lower, so, for example, than they were before the Clean Air Act. So we're getting down to levels of NOx and soot, which are almost unmeasurable. And again, the only reason they're measurable is because we keep investing in measurement technology too, but they're very, very low. Still though, to your point, there's concentrations in the US where it's because of the, because there's so much traffic there, ports are a good example of that. You can have neighborhoods which are more, are, are more affected. And so what we've been introducing is natural gas, 
mm -hmm. uh, and other fuel technologies into those environments so that you can even go, go lower than the, the national regulations. That's really had a big positive impact on places like ports. And our, in our, our investments in the future, what we're looking to do is for all of our current technologies, make sure that the platform is fuel agnostic. So even if it's an internal combustion engine, it'll run on natural gas, it'll run on renewable fuel, it'll run on hydrogen. Every new internal combustion engine will run on all those fuels so we can bring down criteria pollutants as well as carbon, as well as then launch batteries and fuel cells. If today in Indiana, I put a battery electric powertrain in a truck, it will actually generate more carbon on a wells to wheels basis than if I put a natural gas engine in the same truck. And the reason is that the grid isn't, you know, still has too much coal in it from a carbon point of view. It has natural gas, but also has coal and other other mixes. So that's why I was saying that at the same time that we move these other technologies along, we want to move the grid along so that what we're doing is, you know, get, getting to the final wells to wheels solution we want. Um, but but just just suffice it to say that Cummins will continue to invest in technologies both on the internal combustion side to reduce the impact of criteria pollutants and reduce it in, in parts of the country where it is concentrated. And at the same time, we will be introducing the new technologies, which are zero carbon as long as the grid is zero carbon. Right. But I mean, people shouldn't be confused about the fact that if your grid isn't zero carbon, a battery electric vehicle is not zero carbon. Yeah, and, 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 those, and, and just making those connections between you know, transport sector and the right. electric power grid for so long, they were thought of as separate. And of course, now it's, it's all not, integrated. You can't you know, clean one up without are, I think there are people out there that think somehow industry is dragging our feet by saying, well, we still have to deploy internal combustion engines. But just I just want to be clear with you and your audience. We are not dragging our feet. We are investing at, at, at speed all we can invest in battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicle powertrains. We are ready to go. The problem today is they are not at the same cost and there is no infrastructure to support them. So people don't want to buy them. We will, we are selling yeah. today. And in some sectors, people are buying. Uh, we, we are selling uh, uh, bus engines, quite a few batteries in, in both school bus and, and transit bus. And we're selling fuel cell powertrains to, to passenger trains in Europe. Both customers are, you know, have tax revenue that they can use so they can subsidize the purchase and they can make it happen and they run fine. The issue is the cost and the and infrastructure necessary for a customer to make that choice across a wide, you know, big, a big fleet is not easy to make today. And that's why I'm trying to push on the, the, the Build Back Better Act provisions, as well as the carbon price provisions, as well as keep investing in the technology. So we move everything forward. So if you're, if, you, if, if Nat Cohane's fleet of 30 trucks looks at this and says, no, this, I can do this, uh, I'm in. Uh, that's, what, that's where we need to get to. And then the grid supports you from a both availability and, and carbon point of view, then battery electric or fuel cell electric are gonna be the winner. Yeah, that's, I, I was just gonna pick up on that. And, and I know there's some questions starting to come in, but just, I, I was gonna ask you about the business case that hmm. you see from customers for reducing emissions from trucks. And I, and I think that's just what you were getting at. In a sense, there already is a business case in some places, in some sec, I mean, a clear business case. And if we're going to get all the way there, it's some of those other pieces of the puzzle that will just accelerate it. I mean, eventually, I think everybody knows, like transportation is going to be electrified eventually. The question is, can we do it fast enough to help to give a chance at, you know, at meeting our climate goals? And I, and I think, it, so what I'm hearing is, it's the progress of technology, but it's also a lot of those policy provisions, the infrastructure investment and so on, yeah. that will just make that business case so much simpler. Yeah, I, th I think the technology coming from us and other companies that are focused on these powertrains, we will beat the infrastructure. There will be all the, all the technologies will be available at scale, at good performance before infrastructure is available. That's how fast people are moving. It's really, it's, it is, at least to me, encouraging to see the number of companies you know not every but i see most companies falling over and saying i need to be in this and i need to be in this with serious dollars i i, I spoke with larry fink um about kind of investments in sustainable technologies and things like this and what he said is we will only meet our climate change goals if big companies existing companies current players mm -hmm. get in you know the startups are not going to be enough and he said and you got to move faster 
his advice to me was move faster, invest more, put more money in, try to grow that business faster. And, and I, you know, I, he's, he's got a broad view. And, and I, so I take what he says with pretty seriously. And I thought it was right. I stepped back and I said, mm, we could do more. That's in, in fact, some of that was led to the acquisition of Meritor we made where I thought we could deploy electric powertrains more quickly by combining forces with somebody who had already some traction drives to combine with our batteries and controls. Um, so I'm going to let, let me come to some of the questions uh, that we have and let me combine combine a couple. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on the sort of the role of the private sector in companies like Cummins in driving policy. We talked about the sign on statement, but what else should companies, can companies do to advance climate provisions generally? And, and, and how are you engaging uh, with, and, and how do you think companies should engage with trade associations on that? Because I know there's the Cummins view and then there's also, you know, what happens with trade associations. Yeah, as you know, trade associations are often compromises. Uh, so we work in all the trade associations and sometimes we get them to where we want to get to and sometimes not. When I was on the business round table, we were working on our climate statement for some time. It's probably close to where it needs to be now, but when I first started working on it, there were a lot of companies on the on the committee working on that who didn't want to write about carbon tax. So there's always compromises. That said, um, so that's why I think, you know, I think companies need to stand up and be counted on their own as well as be in in um, these industry associations, both. Um, I think a couple things companies should be doing is I mentioned one, which is making sure that when we look at legislation, we don't wait for the perfect. We mm -hmm. go for the good or for the most important, the thing that's going to save our grandkids lives. And then we deal with some of the mess later. I mean, I'm not pleased about that. I, I'm sorry that that's my choice. I'd rather have the perfect, uh, but I do think we can sometimes get overly focused on either the short term or other concerns we've got. And, and it's understandable why, like we, we have an activist in our stock, they're not gonna be too patient for us to look at the long run. But I do think that still as, as leaders and citizens, we've gotta think what's the critical thing to do. Second thing is I think we need to show up at things like the climate sum summit in Glasgow and other places where normally there's only government people and, and start saying, look, we'll be ready. You're moving. You guys are moving too slow and don't let them keep talking about how the private sector is the problem and this and that and the other saying show up and say we, we're ready. Are you and start and start, you know, putting our our or in the water about what needs to be done to get it to get ready. I mean, in, internalizing the price of carbon is a good example. And lastly, I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm just always going to be trying to under, help build our entire industry support for moving forward. Even if I don't win every argument, I'm still going to keep making the argument and see if I can get more more hours in the water from our industry. Well, Tom, I, I have a long list of questions here that have come in and that we'll have to leave for another day because I think that is a great place to end. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, Tom, uh, and really everything from American competitiveness and the role of policy to, you know, a little primer on uh, on carbon pricing and and also some real thinking about um, how this connects up to the electric power grid and, and what all of this means for local communities. Um, really, really terrific to have you on. I, Tom, I really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, thanks so much to you and, and, to, and for your leadership as well. Tom Leinberger of Cummins, thanks so much for, uh, for spending time with us. Thanks, Nat. It's great to see you. Yeah, all the best. Take care.